exists. New Center 11's Sally Fitz covered both sides of the story and files this report. It was earlier estimated that 25% of the service stations would be closed today, but that estimate appears low. Motorists drove by one service station after another today and found out that most were closed. How many places have you tried? This is the third place. I heard that something like this might happen, but I didn't realize that it was going to be closed today. I'm almost out of gas now. In fact, we may have ran out of gas now. And at least one service station manager says it's not going to get better anytime soon. Uh, I would hope that it would end pretty soon, but uh, I would expect at least through June, possibly into, uh, into the fall. Is it going to get worse? I hope not, but if it does, they're going to cut us down further. Uh, we're going to use 77 allocation as a basis as opposed to 78, and if that happens, it's going to hurt quite badly. The executive director of the Minnesota Service Station says it's impossible to know just how many service stations were closed today, but he says next weekend may even be worse because it's the end of the month and just before new supplies are delivered. And while there's a shortage of gasoline, there's now a surplus of natural gas. The government says companies like Minigasco may soon have more natural gas to sell. It's called a natural gas bubble, where temporarily there's more available. The reason why? People have conserved between 10 and 15 percent. Experts feel it could take several years for that bubble to break. The irony is it's just two years ago that natural gas supplies were low, and people were told to turn back their thermostats. Sally Fitz, News Center 11. As it turns out, several thousand Minnesotans could be without gas or electric service if they don't pay their overdue bills and pay them soon. Northern State Power says it's sending out the largest number of final notices in their history. Some 25,000 customers will receive the notices in the mail, and many could find themselves in a bind without service by the second day of April. Van White, DFL-endorsed candidate for the Fifth Ward, says that he has asked for a review of the convention proceedings which nominated him. White's actions are in response to claims by Dorothy James that White was nominated illegally. James opposed White for that nomination. Today, White reaffirmed his belief that the convention was conducted fairly. And then, without mentioning any names, he questioned the motives of his critics. This is the way he put it this afternoon to our cameras. I cannot, I cannot understand why anyone who felt there were discrepancies at the convention did not raise their objections at the convention itself instead of a month after the con convention was held. White will run for the seat currently held by Louis DeMars. James, says, uh, James has said that she will run against White as an independent in the September primary. 21-year-old Minneapolis woman has been charged with pimping and prostitution in connection with a 15-year-old girl from Wisconsin. The woman, Mary Louise Levins, was freed on $4,000 bond in Yankton, South Dakota, and she'll be arraigned early next month. A head-on collision last night on Highway 169 near Scott City, Minnesota, killed two Wisconsin men and injured three others. Dead are Charles McGalloway of Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, and Joel Erickson of Clyman, Wisconsin. Meanwhile, in Carver County, Minnesota, last night, a two-car accident on Highway 25 claimed one life. Authorities could not release the name of the victim until the relatives could be notified. Well, moving to a lighter story, nature lovers help ring in the maple syrup season, this being spring, with a bit of old-fashioned tapping and tasting this weekend. The celebration at the Eastman Nature Center in Maple Plain included free demonstrations for anybody hardy enough to brave the brisk March breeze. Park employees show those attending which trees to tap, how to collect the sap, and how to boil the whole thing into syrup. The finale, of course, was a tasting session. A sweet success, they tell us, by the number of sticky fingers in evidence. Just take a look for yourself. Students from around the state are using everything from hammers to paintbrushes in hopes of being tagged tops in their field. Students are from the Minnesota Vocational Technical Institutes. Beginning this weekend, they're going to be competing in a three-day statewide skill competition in subjects ranging from carpentry to magazine layout. After the dust is settled and the projects are completed, three winners will be chosen to compete in the National Skill Olympics this summer in Atlanta, Georgia. From there, for the winners, it's on to the world competition in Ireland, and I, for one, will not be there because I cannot hammer a nail. Agatha Christie mystery novels have been read, of course, by millions of people all over the globe. And now there's a movie about the famous writer. And New Center 11's entertainment editor, Nancy Nelson, is here in the studio tonight to tell us all about the strange and mysterious goings on. Well, Stan, I was a bit leery of seeing Agatha. I was concerned that it wouldn't do justice to the grand dame of mystery. But Agatha Christie would have been proud. In December 1926, Agatha Christie actually disappeared for 11 days. And in the best tradition of her mystery writing, where she was for those 11 days has never been learned. The film stars Dustin Hoffman and Vanessa Redgrave, but the real stars of this movie are the director, Michael Apted and the photographer Vittorio Storio. 
Agatha is as perfect a movie as I can ever remember seeing. Visually magnificent, wonderfully written, beautifully acted. Agatha is a film of class and quality. There's another twist. The movie has again prompted interest as to Agatha's actual whereabouts those 11 days. A Los Angeles psychic, Tamara Rand, held a seance and claims to have learned from Agatha herself the first clue into the mystery of Agatha's disappearance. I am seeing a key. I see 411. She is in room 411. Agatha. Now she's in the lobby. She's almost checking to see that the key will always be there if she needs it or wants it again. She has left a key to a box. We are to go get the key. The key has been found, and supposedly it will open Agatha's lost diary and end her final real-life mystery. Whether you believe in seances or not, the movie is completely separate. Agatha is a motion picture experience unparalleled. Adjectives simply don't do it justice. Let me suggest that you put it at the top of your movies to see list. Stan? Oh, that's very interesting. Okay, Nancy, thank you very much. Coming up in just a moment, Arab unrest is starting to show in the Middle East peace negotiations, and there still are a few hitches left in those negotiations for the peace treaty. We'll have those stories and more when News Center 11 for a Sunday night continues. Only Diner's Double Card gives you one card for business expenses, one card for personal expenses. He's got one card for work and... One card for fun. Two cards are better than one. You get one card for work, one card for fun. Two cards are better than one. <laughs> Excuse me, boss, is this work or fun? Fun. 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 Diner's Double Card. More card than you've ever had. Hats off to Breck because clean body really lasts. Hats off to Breck shampoo with the thick formula. It gives hair a clean body like this, without heavy, oily conditioners that attract dirt and weigh hair down like this. So, hats off to Breck. Hats off to Breck for giving me clean body. Breck shampoo gives clean body that lasts and lasts. In national news, two bombs shattered windows in the American Embassy in Damascus, Syria today. In Damascus, Syria, that is. There were no reports of any injury or serious damage, and nobody has claimed responsibility or credit for the attack. However, Syria is warning that tomorrow's peace treaty signing will lead to more tension in the Middle East. And speaking of the potential signing of that peace treaty, Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin on the CBS program Face the Nation said that he will meet early this evening to iron out what he terms last-minute problems with Egyptian President Anwar Sadat. Well, I'm going to see President Sadat today in Washington at 6 o'clock. It will be an unprecedented meeting because I'm going to see him in the Egyptian embassy. And we have several problems to uh, talk about. Last night, Secretary of State Cyrus Vance rushed over to New York to iron out some last-minute questions there. Israel apparently is unhappy about the differences over the Sinai oil fields and about the PLO. The President of the United States several months ago in a public statement likened the PLO to the Nazis. Well, I, I wouldn't negotiate with Nazis, and so I will not with the PLO. No matter what they do, even if they change their My position. My dear friend, uh, this is the most barbaric armed organization ever since there was a Gestapo or an SA or an SS. They plan killing children, women, and men. When they do so, they rejoice in it. Meanwhile, Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Dayan, while appearing on ABC's Issues and Answers today, said if Israel cannot find a solution to the Sinai oil field problem, then Israel cannot sign the peace accords. At the same time, on NBC's Meet the Press, former uh, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger said that he was pleased and surprised over the Mideast peace accords. Mr. Kissinger said that he's actually more worried about the salt talks. He believes the U.S. needs to toughen up its image. If a small Caribbean country of nine million can send expeditionary forces around the world uh, without penalty, uh, whose practical consequence is to undermine the Western and often the American position, and we say we cannot do something, that this in itself is an admission of weakness that will demoralize our friends. If the Soviet Air Force is stationed in Cuba 
uh, flying missions to protect Cuba so that the Cuban Air Force can go to Africa. That raises an issue between the Soviet Union and us, which we have to address and which we have to state is not acceptable to us. And while all this was going on, where was the President of the United States? Well, Mr. Carter flew to Texas today on the second leg of a political fence-mending trip. Mr. Carter is in Dallas today to address the convention of the National Association of Broadcasters. Of course, the President will be returning to Washington for tomorrow afternoon's historic signing of the Middle East Peace Accords. By the way, President Carter may be a little lip-weary from his trip last night to Elk City, Oklahoma, as you can see. That's because the President may have worn himself out kissing not one but five, count them five, of Elk City's fair ladies. From Washington tonight comes word that a consumer group claims decontrolling the price of U.S. produced crude oil will cost users about $68.5 million a day. The group called Energy Action says the deregulation plan being considered by President Carter will only put a higher price on oil that would have to be produced anyway. Mr. Carter is expected to address the nation on Thursday. He reportedly is considering taking steps to allow the cost of U.S. produced oil to rise gradually to world market prices. Okay, time now to check in with Keith Eichner and find out what the weather has been like. It wasn't too bad today. A little chilly, but all right. That's great. Uh, changeable weather coming up. That's going to be the trend over the next couple of days, and we'll have the details of that coming up in one moment on News Center 11. Orbit tastes so good, you won't believe it's sugar free. Orbit tastes great. The first time I tried it, I couldn't believe it was sugar free. A lot of my customers tell me the same thing. He's right. Orbit does taste great. I was surprised to find out it's sugar-free. So were my kids. They really like the taste of sugar-free Orbit. And I like the fact that Orbit's made with only natural sweeteners. Tastes cool and refreshing, too. Orbit tastes so good, you won't believe it's sugar-free. Get some soon and see for yourself. <laughs> Three in one oil. The silencer. Aaron. Aaron's. More than a name, it's a promise. Aaron's. In winter, Aaron's. Aaron's throws snow. In spring, Aaron's. Aaron's prepares the rose. Plants. In summer, Aaron's. Aaron's mows. Grass. In fall, Aaron's. Aaron's vacuums. Leaves. Aaron's. Promise. A cut above the rest. Weather conditions today were not too bad overall. We had some cloud cover, but we had the sunshine this morning. And if you're outside today, look at the stream here. Now, this is actually a waterfall. This is at St. Anthony's Falls. And you can see the little ducklings here, real small. We could hardly see them when we were looking at this earlier. But here they are floating and enjoying the weather. The weather, a little bit cold for ducklings at this time of the year. And that's, uh, a matter of fact, it's kind of cold for all of us because we're still running about 10 degrees below normal for this time of the year. But we'll see temperatures begin to warm up. I don't know when that's going to occur, but it's going to occur sometime. It's beginning to get to all of us right now. <laughs> Let's look at the present temperature. Let's look at the high and low. First of all, that's a good start. We had a high today of 32 degrees. That's the best we could do. The low this morning was 17. And presently at 5 o'clock in the Twin Cities, the temperature now at 31 degrees. Relative humidity, 37 percent. That's dry air. Winds, well, they're out of the north at 9 miles per hour. We have a falling barometer at 29.93 inches of mercury. On the national weather map, we have what we call a high zonal index. Now what that means is that after last week with blocking of upper air systems, we are now going to see rapid changes developing across our weather across the entire nation this week. Winds, so what that simply means is that winds at aloft are very, very strong out of the west and we're going to be seeing change after change after change over the next couple of days. One change, well, when we broke out of the cloud cover on Friday and got into sunshine yesterday, now we have a storm system approaching us from the, uh, from the uh, Rockies. This storm will move rapidly off to our northeast during tomorrow. Then we'll get into fair weather tomorrow afternoon. And then another storm, which will take shape across the extreme far western Pacific. This will begin to move in and affect us on Tuesday. So we're going to be in, out, and in again in terms of bad weather over the next couple of days. Meanwhile, though, there is a, uh, there is a storm watch still in effect for the, for the Red River Valley of North Dakota and Minnesota. Snow breaking out all across Minnesota, Montana, and north into Canada. This storm system is going to move in a southeasterly direction. And once this wind shift line trailing to the south of the, cold, uh, south of the low pressure system passes through, our winds are going to pick up rather strongly tomorrow. We'll see north winds at 20 to 30 miles per hour. Meanwhile, across the east, 
Temperatures are still rather warm. Rain breaking out across Maine, but look at this. Snow seen as far south as Nashville, Tennessee, and there isn't too much rain to be seen on the map. It's been basically just a cold pattern, and we're going to see that cold pattern intensify over the next couple of days. Let's look at the satellite picture. You'll see across the east still a large area of clouds swirling across the Ohio Valley. Elsewhere, though, as you can see, here we are. Here's the cloud cover, but here's the next storm just to our north and west now. This storm system with the cold front continuing to move in an easterly direction, and we'll be in some of that fair weather that will develop behind the cold front during tomorrow. But then, as we look out here, another storm beginning to gain strength across the western Pacific. Let's look at the five-state map right now. And everywhere, skies are generally partly to mostly cloudy. And these are the expected low temperatures for tonight. We'll see temperatures in the upper teens across the Twin Cities, but dropping down to between 10 and 15. And a large band of snow will be moving in from North Dakota and moving across the northern one-half of Minnesota. Let's look at storm search radar. Now, about an hour ago, we were, we were showing some precipitation echoes, but for the most part, it seems to have cleared out for now, and that means that uh, we'll have to keep our eyes out because we could see some snow developing here maybe later tonight. And the forecast then, for tonight, mainly cloudy. Some light snow showers will be developing, low temperatures between uh, 18 and 23 degrees. And then for tomorrow, we'll have snow showers in the morning becoming partially sunny in the afternoon, but strong north-northwesterly winds of 15 to 30 miles per hour highs, near 30, and for Tuesday, San, another possibility of snow will just say cloudy for now and cold. But those, those high winds are probably going to mean a wind chill factor of uh, roughly about what tomorrow? Any idea? Probably around 0 to minus 10. Okay, that ain't too thrilling. Thank you very much, Keith. We have some more national news here. One more note. In Uganda, they're feeling the pressure of Tanzanian-led invasion forces there. They've closed the country's only international airport in Entebbe, and they've imposed a curfew on Kampala. Uganda Radio warned that anybody violating Ugandan airspace would be shot down without any warning whatsoever. An official sources in Nairobi report that the Tanzanian troops and Ugandan rebels are shelling the airport and are now within 20 miles of Kampala, the capital city. Things are certainly heating up there. Things heated up pretty much in Detroit last night, too. Oh, they were just about as hot as they can get. As <laughs> Gophers, Gophers won the National Hockey Championship. Highlights, interviews, look at all the celebration from Detroit when News Center 11 continues. When most people see a Glenwood Inglewood water dispenser, that's all they see, water. I see happy and productive employees and a tax-deductible business expense that pays for itself with shorter coffee breaks. And my employees, well, they see hearty soups and broths, frosty iced tea, rich hot chocolate and steaming coffee. Why not see what's in the Glenwood Spring water cooler for you? You're my relief man. Relief person. Is that so? Well, maybe you can give me a little relief for this cold. Stuffy nose and cough, huh? Here. Paul's menthol. Paul's mentholiptus with vapor action. Hey, that's strong. That's vapor action. It penetrates deep to make your nasal passages feel clearer. And Hall's cools your throat to help your cough. You're a terrific relief mad person. <laughs> Hall's mental lift is with vapor action in cherry and honey lemon, too. Okay, time for Steve Pacetti in the sports. And I must say, some of those people that traveled to Detroit to watch the Gophers win the game last night probably had a little hangover today. I imagine they're recovering <laughs> from a lot of hangovers. I imagine the, the Plaza Hotel of Detroit is recovering, too, because there are all kinds of parties going on over the whole hotel last night. The players and the fans, lots of partying, something you wouldn't want to miss. Take it from someone who had to miss it or miss my plane back home. Bottom line, third time in six years. Gopher hockey team, national champs. There were moments in Detroit last night when few people thought it would end this way, with Minnesota Gopher coach Herb Brooks holding his third national championship trophy. The Gophers, as usual, soared into an early comfortable two-goal lead. First, Steve Kristoff splitting the North Dakota defense to beat goalie Bill Stankovin, which is the last goalie ever to win against Minnesota this season. Then John Meredith wound up and drilled one past Stankovin for the Gophers' second tally. Teams then exchanged goals to end the first period, 3-1, Minnesota. But then North Dakota pulls Stankovin in favor of Bill Iwabuchi. It psyched the Gopher offense, which played as if it were made of five defensemen during the second period. North Dakota assaulting Minnesota. Kevin Maxwell closing the score to 3-2 to with his goal off Steve Janizak's stick. And Gopher fans were sweating it out. The heroes emerged for Minnesota. Neil Broughton with the clincher. An unbelievable flying shot past Iwabuchi. That was the Gophers' fourth goal. But it was again Steve Janizak saving the game with two dazzling stops late in the contest. And when the Gophers cleared the zone for the last time, well, there are just no words to describe the scene.
Senior goalie Janizak deservedly got the tourney's MVP trophy, but refused to take all the credit. I feel myself it was a team effort. My team came out strong. We win it as a team. We've been a team all season. This is where, this is our dream. For Coach Brooks, his third title in six years, this one perhaps the toughest. I've been hard on this hockey club, there's no question. I don't know if this hockey club really wanted to admit that they could be a champion. Uh, it's still a young hockey club with just uh, basically three seniors playing on a regular basis. Uh, Joe Baker, another senior, gave us a lot of inspiration on the bench. But I didn't know if they wanted to admit they could do it. Back in that rough time in January, did you think he'd be here right now? Uh, to be honest with you, no. What is important is that he said that last night. Coach Brooks never doubted his team when it really counted. His record speaks for itself. He's quite a leader and he should do very well. Now in his new job, 1980 Olympic. Coach, the next goal for team with a shot at the national title is the gymnastics team. Men qualifying yesterday for the nationals in a regional meet. Nationals coming up April 5th at Louisiana State University. Okay, yesterday we had the girls, uh, girls basketball championships here in Minnesota. Today, as you just saw on Channel 11, the college girls playing for their national championship. Take a look at Nancy Lieberman. She's one of the best in college ball. She is playing for Old Dominion, kind of the UCLA of girls basketball. Old Dominion beating Louisiana Tech for the championship today, 75 to 66. Now, on the men's side, tomorrow night, champion. 8 o'clock here on Channel 11. Indiana State and Michigan State. DePaul lost yesterday, but to soften the blow, Coach Ray Meyer of the DePaul Blue Demons today named Coach of the Year by the basketball writers. And they're battling for playoff spots in the NBA. A couple of teams once tabbed as dynasties, just scrapping to get a playoff berth. Portland and the Denver Nuggets. And today the Denver Nuggets showing that they're going to get in the playoffs. George McGinnis making plays like this. A steal and then the slam dunk. Nuggets to a 10-point win over Los Angeles. Lots of help from this man, Charlie Scotty, at 28 points. That final, Denver 123, L.A. 113. Other NBA scores, Boston beating the 76ers. New Jersey over Chicago. Washington clinched the Atlantic Division, winning by 9 points. San Antonio beat Indiana. The Twins won today, 9-4. To quite a romp over the Astros. Everyone getting hits. Hoskin Powell, 3 RBI. And more good news, Willie Norwood and Danny Goodwin both signed contracts. Some teams down to south are not being so lucky. Third base. This is third base for the Atlanta Braves, and it's going to be quite a problem for them because Bob Horner is not in that hot corner. Mike Maha, a rookie, is playing. Horner, of course, rookie of the year last year. He wants lots of bucks, 300000 The Braves say no way, and the Horner says, well, he won't play then. And he's not even getting any support from his teammates. Maybe if this year he, uh, he does the same thing, hits you know, the same at-bat home run ratio, well, maybe you're talking about some money next year, but still then not even $300,000. Yeah. It's still too much for a 22-year-old kid. It's, it's an awful lot of money for, for anyone. Uh, yeah. Yes. North Stars play tonight a big game in Vancouver, and we'll have those scores at 10 o'clock. Okay, it seems like basketball season is now 11 and a half months uh, <laughs> long. Only half more months, and it'll be over. That does it for now. That's the 5 o'clock edition of the news. Uh, we'll be back tonight at 10 o'clock with all the latest. Until then, for all of us here at News Center 11, I'm Stan Borman. Thanks for watching, and have a good evening. Africa like Trader Horn, but now the British want him out. It's Colonel Sinclair and his soldiers, they're coming up river. How far back? Close. And the Germans want him dead. He just wants to get out alive with a fortune in platinum. Let's well, the back country, get some wagons and try to make it to Lagunja. Rest of you men, follow me. That's the devil. And his only friends are the Watusis. Yahweh, mommy. 
And now, on the late night movie, Trader Horn. This is NBC Nightly News, Sunday, March 25th. With Jessica Savage reporting and Dick Schaap with sports.